All right, hey you guys, I'm going to try to quickly get through this pretest. Hopefully no babies wake up in the middle or else I am going to end it and then I'll just start a new one because um, I am going to be doing 75 questions, so it'll probably take me a while. I'm going to try to kind of go through it. Um, I won't too much give you um, too many hints um, about what the answer is. I will try to read the rationale, though. Um, and then also, if you did not watch the previous video, go back and watch it because it has um, test-taking tips in it. All right, so question number one. Um, a 38-year-old client who is gravid of four, pair of two, um, with gestational diabetes is scheduled for an amniocentesis. Okay, this is at 36 weeks gestation because of an unstable blood sugar. The results from the amniocentesis show a um, ratio of LS, one to one, and PG is negative. How should the nurse best interpret this, da this data? All right, so answer one, the infant is a low risk for congenital abnormalities. Two, the infant is at high risk for um, intrauterine, intrauterine growth retardation. Um, the infant is at high risk for respiratory distress syndrome, and the infant is at high risk for birth trauma. So amniocentesis does not tell you um, if they're low risk for congenital abnormalities, right? You have to be looking for a certain um, test, but more than likely they are doing this test because they are afraid that they do have um, something going on. So I can go ahead and eliminate number one and then also number two, because it says they're high risk for entry and growth retardation. Um, that means like they're at a um, they stop growing, but when a mother is diabetic or has gestational diabetes, she is at risk for having a larger baby. Um, so I'm going to pick number three. The infant is at high risk for respiratory distress syndrome, just because I know what the test is for. Um, but let me make sure. All right, so correct answer is number three. Um, because the test is performed to determine fetal um, lung maturity, the LS ratio should be two to one. For her, it was one to one and positive for PG um, for the infant who could be low risk for respiratory distress. Okay, so four is incorrect because amniocentesis is not used to test birth trauma, as I stated. The inc uh, one is incorrect because amniocentesis in this case should not be used to determine congenital abnormalities. And then two is incorrect because amniocentesis does not establish intrauterine growth retardation. All right, so contender, can, um, consider the client's condition and amniocentesis at 33 weeks gestation is used to establish lung maturity in the unborn fetus. Eliminate answers that do not deal with directly with the client's condition. All right. Question number two, the client who is overweight and has diabetes has a blood pressure of 148 over 92. The client's urinalysis reveals microalbuminuria, um, um, so they have albumin leaking into their urine. The client does not want to take drugs despite the family history of a stroke, a CVA, the correct response, so this is going to be like therapeutic response, I always hate these questions, so is it to recheck the blood pressure weekly, this is what they're saying, the answers are in quotes, so recheck blood pressure weekly, yeah, we probably will do that, but how is that going to address our situation, um, so evaluate barriers to weight loss and make a plan for the patient that is going to be helpful, but how are we going to deal with their blood pressure today, which is 148 over 92, okay, so use a drug while um, lifestyle changes is being instituted, that's probably the correct answer, one is find herbal products to reduce blood pressure and weight. Um, that's not up for the nurse to suggest. So I know one number one is definitely not an, um, an option. All right, so correct answer is number two. Two is correct because it is an impeding disaster, right? They have a family history of um, stroke and uncontrolled hypertension will lead to a stroke. All right, so only one option will definitely reduce the blood pressure, which is the 
uh, drug therapy. We do want to implement lifestyle changes and encourage that, but because they do have a family history of stroke, um, you need to do something on top of the lifestyle changes. All right. Question number three. A school nurse is called to the playground during recess to see a child with hemophilia who has just collided with a friend. Um, the knee is bruised and swollen and the child reports significant pain. All right. So they have a bleeding disorder, right? Um, this is select all that applies. Call emergency um, services, call EMS, wrap the knee with compression bandage, yes, probably. Provide crutches for mobility, probably. Apply ice, probably. Um, evaluate the injured extremity, or sorry, e elevate the ex um, injured extremity, probably. Suggest a child to stay indoors, probably not. Um, it says stay indoors during recess, no because you still want them to be active. So I would say wrap the knee, provide crutches, ice, and elevate. Um, I don't know if you guys know the term um, rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevate. Okay, so I'm gonna go with those. I don't remember all that I picked already, but let's see. So question number three, two, four, and five are correct. Two is correct because the nurse should apply a wrap to the knee for immobility and compression. Three is incorrect <clears throat> because the client should not continue to ambulate. It may worsen the injury. Okay, and then one is incorrect because the in, um, EMS is not necessary. Four is correct because ice should be applied to constrict the vessels and reduce bleeding. Five is correct because elevating will help reduce swelling and bleeding. Six is incorrect because you should not keep the kid indoors. Um, you should just allow them to do self-limiting activities and lead as normal life as possible. All right. Oh, so look, it says use the mnemonic RICE, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Okay. To remember this treatment for hemophilia. And pretty much that is what you use for um, like any injury. They say they twisted their knee or whatever else goes going on. Okay. So question number four. Which clinical um, feature found on assessment should indicate to a nurse that a client has CHF? All right, so CHF. We know the difference between right-sided, left-sided. You can remember left because uh, you have lung issues, so you'll have the um, crackles in the lungs, and right side is usually... Um, I believe the JVD, and then also the peripheral edema and side effects, okay, as well as, I believe, ascites. Okay, so options are fatigue, dyspnea, Cheyenne Stokes breathing, orthostatic hypotension, liver tenderness, peripheral edema, um, pulmonary crackles, and weak pulses. All right, so it seems like the answers are kind of mixed up, so you definitely have to know what um, signs and symptoms are of CHF. So fatigue and dyspnea, definitely one. Um, they're having fluid volume overload, they're very tired, and they're gonna have trouble breathing, which is this dyspnea um, for left-sided, okay? Cheyenne Stokes breathing, this is usually associated with um, like something neurological going on most times, or if they're close to death, because um, it's like that. Um, uneven breathing, like sometimes you'll have fast um, respiration rate, then it'll slow down, and then I think periods of apnea or something like that, okay, and usually you see this in the dying, um, so that's probably not it, well, I know it's not it, and then it also says um, Cheyenne Stokes breathing and orthostatic hypotension, which you're not going to have hypotension if you have heart failure, you're going to have um, fluid volume overload, you're going to have bounding pulses, Okay, so liver tenderness and peripheral edema, probably not. Um, you, they, you shouldn't have liver pain. You may have a swollen liver um, with peripheral edema, especially if you have right-sided, but it shouldn't be painful, so I won't pick that. And then pulmonary crackles and weak pulses. Um, you would have pulmonary crackles with left-sided, but you would not have weak pulses. Uh, fluid volume overload is basically um, 
what CHF is, okay? So bounding pulses. So I'm going to go with number one, fatigue and dyspnea. Let's see what we got. My question is number four, we are number four. Yes, so number one is correct because congestive heart failure or right-sided heart failure reduces cardiac output, circulation, O2 is reduced and it produces the fatigue and the shortness of breath, okay? All right, question number five. The nurse is caring for a client at 32 weeks gestation who has been admitted for um, to the OB unit with complete placenta previa. All right, so you have to know what placenta previa is. Which symptoms should the nurse identify as being a result um, of the client's condition? All right, so what is placenta previa? I hope you guys know. Uh, I see that somebody is watching, even though it's really late but I, I can't see who it is. So if you wanna comment or like try to answer some of the questions, feel free. Um, but placenta previa is when the placenta implants, like say this is the cervix here and the baby would come out from this way here, right? So this is your vagina opening. This is the cervix, the placenta implants right on top. Okay, so most of the time when this happens, you do have to end up getting a C-section. Um, and the most common signs and symptoms is painless bleeding. Um, so let's look at our options. Um, so painless vaginal bleeding, that is one. Um, titanic uterine contractions, I don't think you would really have contractions. Premature rupture of membranes. Um, I don't think that's associated with it. Decreased hemoglobin, yes, because you're bleeding, so therefore your hemoglobin has decreased. Rigid board-like abdomen, I don't think so. All right, so that's probably also like a sign or, or like another way to say contraction, all right? So number five, correct answer, one and four. One is correct because pain, uh, painless vaginal bleeding is a common symptom of complete placenta previa, okay? Two is incorrect because tetanic uh, uterine contractions is a symptom of placental, uh, placental abruption, and that is when the placenta is completely moving away from the uterine wall, and that is definitely an emergency. Um, Okay, so question three is incorrect because premature um, placental rupture is not a sign or symptom. Um, this is a symptom of placenta abruption. Four is correct because hemoglobin is going to be low in response to bleeding. Five is incorrect because board-like rigid abdomen um, is associated with placenta abruption. So you have to know the difference between the two. Again, um, placenta previa, painless bleeding, um, along with decrease in hemoglobin. All right. And then the placenta abruption, which is the uh, placenta removing from the uterine wall, you are going to have pain, you are going to have bleeding, you are going to have the contractions um, and rigid board-like abdomen as they describe it. Okay, so know the difference. Um, all right. Yeah, so the testing tip, it says it's important to know the difference between abruption and placenta previa, which is the pain. So abruption is very painful. You have many contractions. Placenta previa is painless without contractions. All right. So question number six. Um, let's see. So a four-year-old is hospitalized for acute glomerulonephritis. Um, the nurse should feel most confident. Uh, that the client teaching is effective when the client says what. So this is a four-year-old. It's probably going to be a very basic response. So always think about the age of the patient. Okay, so um, answer number one, I was mean to my sister and um, now I'm sick. No, um, sometimes kids will think that they caused an illness or a death, but um, I think they call that like magical thinking or like fairy tale or something like that, but that is not going to be um, an appropriate response because it doesn't even address um, the type of issue that they have, which is glomerular um, nephritis. 
Okay, I forget exactly what Lumeria nephritis is doing. Um, and I want to say it's like the advanced um, stage of a UTI, like it's moved into the um, kidneys, if I can't, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But anywho, we just want to figure out, or we, I'm going to pick the answer that kind of addresses what is going on um, for the patient, which they have acute glomerulonephritis. All right, so two says, I have a stomach ache, um, but it will get better. Um, that can be so general, just a stomach ache. And then three, I don't have much PP come out when I use the toilet. So I probably would go with that one. And the number four says, I have an infection in my stomach, which is still kind of general. So I would go with number three. Let's see what number three says. Correct answer is number three. Uh, three is correct because the child's statement demonstrates basic knowledge of what is going on, even though they are four years old. Okay, so test taking tip. Note that the only one answer describes a symptom specific to the kidney function, which is kind of how I knew, even though I've kind of forgotten exactly what is going on. Four-year-old client, um, gravita four pair, or sorry, gravita six pair four, delivered a healthy infant at a full term, um, at full term about 18 hours ago. She reports sharp pain in her left calf while walking to the bathroom. A nurse assesses the client's left calf. Um, which she finds the area to be red, warm, and tender. Which of the following actions is appropriate for the client to take? All right, so red, warm, and tender. That is sounding like a DVT. Um, that is, I believe, home and sign. Um, all right, so select all that apply. Instruct the client to massage the calf. Uh, to relieve the pain and tenderness. You never do that. You never massage a clot, okay? That's what a DVT is. Um, encourage the client to ambulate to increase circulation. That is a possibility. I'm kind of borderline. Um, you are worried about circulation, decreased circulation, so that's a possibility. So number two, and then administer anticoagulation as ordered, definitely. Um, eliminate the affected extremity to, or sorry, elevate the affected extremity to promote um, venous blood flow. Uh, probably, probably, okay. And then the last option, number five, is have the client to sit up um, on the side of the bed and have the affected leg dangle. That's like basically hanging on the side. If you do that, it's probably going to increase the edema, so I won't pick that one. I think I'm just gonna go with um, two, three, and four. Let's see, so number seven. Yes, two, three, and four. So one is incorrect because massaging is contraindicated. Pretty much you don't massage anything. That's just kind of what I've learned. All right, leave that to the physical therapy and the masseuse and all that. I'm not massaging nothing. Um, all right, so answer number two is correct because the client should encourage should be encouraged to ambulate in addition to receiving anti um, um, coagulation therapy. All right, this question can kind of throw you off if you look, if you read too into it or too much into it, just because. Um, we know that if you do have a clot such as DVT, you need a thrombolytic to actually break up the clot and then you use the anticoagulation, um, but just don't read too much into it. All right, so, um, so number two is correct because you wanna encourage the circulation since the bed rest itself um, may enhance the venous stasis, which is the pooling of the blood. Um, you want them to get up and to be active as much as possible. Three is correct. Um, the goal is to prevent a PE. So a DVT can turn into a pulmonary embolism, which is a PE. All right. So the clot will break off and it will travel straight to the lungs, which you do not want to do, which is another reason why you do not massage. All right. And then... Um, 
this is what we are most worried about for the most part. Four is correct because elevation of the affected extremity um, is going to promote venous return and decrease that swelling. Okay, makes sense. So the main goal of DVT treatment is to prevent clots from traveling from major organs, or sorry, to major organs causing mortality and morbidity. Eliminate those options that are not consistent with this goal. All right. So number seven, a 34-year-old client who is, I know we already did that one, uh, number eight. So um, a nurse is conducting a seminar for SIDS. Um, the nurse is teaching should emphasize on what. So um, if I could just take a second, remember your test taking skills um, and like think through the order. So SIDS is sudden death, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, right? And we do a lot of teaching about how the baby um, should sleep in the appropriate environment for the baby because the baby usually dies in their sleep and they will call it sudden infant death syndrome all right so the nurse the nurse's teaching should emphasize avoiding soft bedding yes using a pillow no um we worried about suffocation okay so using a soft um sleep surface no probably no okay um uh, promoting self um, a co uh, promoting a co sleeping um, with the pa with the parents. So no, I was just thinking. So we're worried about suffocation. So I think the nurses um, should emphasize on avoiding soft bedding because we don't encourage co sleeping. Although some people do it, I did it, but it is not a recommendation. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna say one, All right? And you don't wanna use a pillow. So this is like pretty easy, this question. Um, so the correct answer is number one. It isn't, it is um, correct because soft bedding for the newborn should be avoided. It is believed that newborn sleeping on soft bedding may um, have increased SIDS because of suffocation and inability to move their head appropriately. Okay, so think about suffocation when answering this question. Eliminate answers that might increase the possibility of this happening. Okay. All right. So question number nine, the laboratory values for an adult who is NPO, which is nothing by mouth, um, are they have a sodium of 128, which is low should be 135 to 145, so you have to know your labs, okay? Potassium is 3.5, normal potassium is 3.5 to 5.5. Glucose is 130, all right? So generally, I just kind of go by the rule that glucose should be 70 to 100, so this is a little high, all right? So which IV solution should the nurse um, expect to be ordered? Will they use D5W with 40 milli equivalents of potassium chloride at 150 um, milliliters per hour? That's kind of fast. Um, and then also it has the D5, D, D10W, which is the high in the um, dextrose, which is basically sugar. So it's going to spike their sugar um, even more. And once the sugar if the dextrose dissolves, um, they're going to be left with just a bunch of fluid, um, which is going in pretty fast at 150 milliliters per hour, which is going to further decrease the sodium. So I probably would not go with that. And then we have the option number two, one fourth normal saline with 20 milli equivalents at 100 liters or milliliters per hour. So again, we have two things are kind of out of whack. Um, sodium being the most important in my opinion because you have the most side effects um, from that. So I wouldn't give one fourth normal saline. I would want to give full normal saline. Um, and then the other option, which is three D5, um, with one fourth normal saline again at 50 milliliters per hour, which is a better rate. It's not going in as fast, but it's not giving us the sodium replacement that we need. And then four, 
gives us D5 normal saline with 20 mL equivalents of potassium chloride at 75 um, milliliters an hour. So I would probably go with number four. Um, if you remember your your um, your anatomy physiology, I think that yeah, anatomy physiology. We learned um, where sodium is and where um, potassium is pertaining to intracellular or extracellular. Sometimes I get these wrong, um, but we do know that sodium and potassium have to be balanced. And I'm trying to think which is inside the cell. I want to say, is potassium inside the cell? Potassium. Um, I can't remember. I think it's potassium, potassium in, and sodium chloride. So I think sodium chloride is usually extracellular and potassium and phosphate is intracellular. Um, hold on one second, let me see. I don't want to give you guys the wrong information. But, um, I went through a question earlier. Okay, so yeah, sodium chloride is extracellular, and then intracellular is where potassium and phosphate would be. So we want to have a balance. We know that sodium follows water um, and there has to be a balance all right because that's how the osmosis and the diffusion and all that occurs if you remember correctly so i'm going with number nine let's see number nine number nine four is correct um all right so four is correct because the client um, needs potassium which cannot be replaced with enteral feedings Fluids are needed when NPO, um, but the low serum sodium um, should not be further diluted. Yeah, so like I said, if you're giving fluid at a fast rate, once the glucose is gone, um, you are just left with a bunch of um, um, extra water, which is going to send them into possibly fluid volume overload, or you're just going to further dilute um, your electrolytes. Sorry, I'm going for some talking a lot. I probably need to get some water too. All right, so question number 10. Um, a nurse is caring for a teenager immediately following surgical um, correction of severe scoliosis. All right, so they just had surgery. Which intervention should the nurse expect to be part of the care plan? All right. So when you think about surgery, um, most of the time it's all the same. Pre-surgery, you want to make sure that they're abiding to the no, um, no food, um, usually like 8 to 12 hours. The doctor will usually tell them. Um, also, any medications that they possibly may need to stop. And then also we're worried about them having um, proper education and consent. Post-surgery, we're usually worried about infection, um, any like side effects from surgery. Um, so if there is a specific surgery, you have to know like the side effects or like risk for bleeding. Um, always bowel sounds and like getting up to prevent DVTs, things like that. All right, so let's start looking at the options. One says administer pain medication around the clock. All right, so this is a teenage patient. They did have major surgery, so we are probably going to want to manage their pain. We were going to want to check circulation, sensation, and movement of the extremities. Yeah, because it was spinal surgery, but even if they had surgery like on their leg or their arm or something like that, you're still worried about circulation, right? Um, three, monitor um, urinary catheter output. Yeah, you want to make sure that they're peeing, um, especially because it was spinal surgery. So what if they did something that um, is decreasing the ability for them to pee? 
Okay, and then most of the time you're on like maintenance fluids too, so you want to have balanced ins and outs. Um, four says assist the patient to a chair once per shift. Uh, once per shift is probably not enough um, because we are worried about DVT, right? Um, or like clots from immobility. And then also assess bowel sounds daily. So yeah, you do want to assess bowel sounds, but you want to make sure. Um, oh, for some reason it is saying unable to connect to chat. Please try again later. I don't know if it's working. I just thought I'd try it. But um, there is somebody watching. So if you can type something back so I can know if it's working or not, because this is only my second time using um, live. That'd be nice. All right. So um, where was I? Oh, surgery. Oh, okay. So bowel sounds. We're worried about the paralytic um, ileus, which is like the paralyzation of the small intestines and even large intestines post-surgery. Um, all right, so I'm probably going to go with one, two, and three. Yeah, so one is correct because the nurse um, can expect to provide pain management. Two is correct because circulation, sensation, movement is important. Um, three is correct because the client will have a urinary catheter in place and you want to make sure the ins are equal to the outs. Um, and then four is incorrect because initial care for a client, um, would be to be log rolling. Oh, okay. So not necessarily trying to get the, the, um, spinal cord injury or like the spinal patient post-surgery up immediately so yeah you do have to try to read carefully and um, pick out the identifiers um, or the words that are going to help you answer the question correctly and sometimes we can get excited and just read and pick an answer right so um, that's why that is incorrect but I still got it right because of the timing um, and then is incorrect because, or sorry, five is incorrect because bowel sounds should be assessed frequently to monitor, yep, for paralytic ileus after surgery. So that's always a big thing. All right, so the key phrase in the stem of the question is immediately following surgery. So yeah, got to pick out the key words. All right, so let's see, a question about maternity. Oh no, okay, it's a question about school age kids. All right, so this question is saying, um, oh, I skipped some. Why am I just skipping all over the place? All right, so next question. A client with um, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, which is SIADH um, secretion, has a sodium of 128 milliequivalents per liter and is confused. The nurse's primary goal should be to what? All right, so we know with inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, they are antidiuretic. Inappropriate antidiuretic. So they're, they're going to be, is it holding on to pee? Well, they're going to be peeing too much, antidiuretic. Yeah. I think they're going to be peeing too much. I always get kind of confused with that. So I always try to think it through. So I think they're going to be peeing too much and their electrolytes are going to be, is it diluted or concentrated? Um, is there a building a bunch of pee? I think they're going to be diluted. Um, but I need to brush up on that. All right, so option number one, decrease edema by restricting fluid intake, or would you pick prevent complications of hyponatremia, orient the client to their surroundings, restore the fluid and electrolyte balance? All right, so the sodium is very low and they're confused. We know that low sodium causes confusion 
um, like some lethargy, also even possible seizures. So decrease edema by restricting fluid intake. I wouldn't do that. I think I want to make sure that I fix the, restore the fluid and the electrolyte balance because that would be the only thing to treat the patient's current condition, um, prevent complications of hyponatremia. That doesn't fix the problem. So um, it, I think that's in there to kind of throw us off and then reorient the client to their surroundings. Yeah, they're confused. And if you reorient them, if we don't fix the problem, they're going to be confused uh, 10 minutes later, if not three seconds later, right? All right, so number 11, correct answer would be number four, yes. So you want to fix the... Um, the, okay, so SIADH causes water retention. Oh, so the antidiuretic hormone, which is preventing you from pee, peeing, yeah. I, thought I always get confused with that. So if you have increased antidiuretic hormone, you're retaining onto more water. So um, you want to reverse that. So if you have more um, water on you, you are diluting your, um, further diluting your electrolytes. All right, so the only answer that is correct, um, both the fluid and electrolyte. Okay, problem is being fixed. All right, and then number, let's see, number 12. So a group of clients who are pregnant are attending a childbirth preparation class. A nurse is discussing the effects of cigarette smoke fetal develop and fetal development. So which characteristic should the nurse describe as being as, um, associated with babies that are born uh, smoking to a smoking mom? All right, so what do we know about smoking? We know that it probably is going to increase their risk for um, lung issues, right? Um, nicotine usually makes you not eat, right? So I'm thinking the baby is going to be on the smaller side. I'm just trying to help you guys like think things out even though you may not know um, exactly like the path though or um, the physiology that goes along with it. All right, so it says option number one, low birth weight, large, and the number two is large for gestational age. Um, that's probably not true. That's gonna pertain to gestational diabetic moms and their babies, they're gonna be large. Preterm birth, excuse me, preterm birth by appropriate, um, but appropriate size for gestation. Um, I don't think it will make them go into labor any sooner. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I think they're going to be um, low birth weight. And then macrosomia, somia, macrosomia. Um, I don't even know what that is off the top of my head. Macrosomia, is that a large head or something? I know macro means large, but I'm going with number one. Is number 12. Okay, so number 12. Let's see. So one is correct because smoking has a direct association with low birth weight. All right. Doubling the risk for infants to have low birth weight. All right. Um, not macrosomia. All right. So eliminate macrosomia and large for gestational age because um they are essentially the same condition oh okay i didn't know what it was all right smoking causes low birth weight not large infants all right so we got that and then number 13 uh, the school nurse inspects a toddler um attending a school's daycare center which observation by the school nurse would um, require follow-up teaching for pinworms. All right, so what do we know about pinworms? They um, are ingested 
Um, they live in your intestines. Sometimes they can spread to other organs, possibly even your brain. And most often we see them, um, we see them come out um, at night. Um, so you'll have like increased anal itching um, for the babies. And we usually use a piece of scotch tape. Um, we'll put it on the baby's bottom. And then um, um, in the morning, we will look at the piece of tape and we usually see eggs or possibly even pin worms. All right, quite disgusting, but that's just what it is. <laughs> okay, so let's see. One, all of the toddlers were wearing shoes and socks. Um, two, I don't think pinworms can be, because um, there are some types of, some worms that, um, like if you walk outside with no shoes or socks on, they can move in through your the, the sole of your feet, but I don't think pinworms is one. I believe they're ingested. Um, okay, so the toddler is not wearing, or is wearing shoes or socks. And then some of the toddlers are wearing one piece outfits that has nothing to do with it. If anything, the toddler is not gonna be able to make it to the bathroom most likely. Uh, they're gonna end up pooping on themselves. Um, most of the toddlers have short fingernails. You probably do want the fingernails to be short so that way, uh, if you're wiping, you don't accidentally get poop and then ingested and all that. It's just easier to be sanitary. And then, oh, I gotta go get that baby's crying. And then most of the toddlers are wearing cloth diapers. So I'm gonna say cloth diapers just because that's something that has to be washed very thoroughly with hot, hot, hot water um, to prevent the spread along with hand washing, right? Um, I'm gonna look at this baby. Let me see. So, number 13. Number 13. Um, four is the correct answer. So, four is correct because um, the use of super absorbent disposable diapers, which prevent leakage are preferred over cloth diapers. Cloth diapers do leak, which can result in feces that may be infested with pinworms. The other name or the medical name for pinworms is enterobiasis. Okay, hold on, I'll be right back. Sorry, you guys. Y'all know I got twins. And he was lying on top of his brother, waking him up. Mm, wake him up. All right. So, yeah, so it's just more sanitary and you can get rid of the, um, of the pinworms a lot faster. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, don't you disturb us either. All right, so next question is, a client who is gravid of four pair two is admitted to the labor and delivery unit. The nurse performs a vaginal examination and determines that the client's service is at a six, at six centimeters dilated, she is 75% effaced and plus one station. Uh. All right, so based on the nurse's assessment, and which stage of labor is this client? All right, so we have to know about our stages. Um, of course, 10, you have to make it to 10 centimeters to be able to push. Um, 
And I believe once you get uh, to 10 centimeters, that is active stage. I think um, I forget about labor and delivery. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, this is still considered first phase. Um, they have options, first phase, latent stage, that's number one, first stage, so phase and stage may be different, okay, well, and then you have active phase, um, first stage, transition phase, and then you have first phase, active stage, uh, I really don't know. I'm just gonna pick, let's just go with C3, the best answer. Let's see if that's right. When in doubt, go with C, that's what they teach you. Uh, school, don't they? Yeah. So what was that, number four, 14? 14, correct answer is number two. So, um, Number two is the correct answer because there are four stages of labor and the first stage covers all phases, okay, of the cervical dilation. So the first stage covers all phases of cervical dilation. This client is in first stage active phase, which is, oh, four to eight centimeters dilation. So you have to know that. All right, so we're gonna have to brush up on that part. All right, next, um, number 15. <clears throat> a client is admitted with a history of um, AAA, the aortic, uh, sorry, abdominal aortic aneurysm. The nurse should know that the client has an impeding rupture of the aneurysm if they report what? All right, so an aortic aneurysm, um, that is the, um, aortic aneurysm, so the abdominal, abdominal aortic uh, aneurysm, so that's the, um, I believe the uh, that is leading down to the stomach, not at the top of the heart, so it's like not the, the aortic arch, but further down leading into your stomach, um, and I believe it's going to be like a deep pain, like, I think they say severe, severe pain, um, like very severe pain, right? So sometimes if you auscultate over the, um, like, epigastric area, you may hear a bruit or even feel a thrill. All right, so here are our options. We have severe right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Um, I don't think it should be severe right upper because if it's on the right, that's the liver, right upper. No, I do believe it should be severe, but the location is not correct. Uh, Persistent or um, intermittent lower back pain. Um, and then would you have absent fetal uh, pulses in both extremities? That's probably if it has um, burst. Um, and then chest pain with epiga in the epigastric region. So, right hmm. let's go with number two, persistent or intermittent lower back pain. You're making a lot of noise, buddy. Making a lot of noise. Right. I'll probably just do a couple more because you guys are going to get to focus with this little bit. All right, so 15. So number two is correct. So um, let's see. So the correct answer for the aneurysm is pressing against the lumbar nerves. Severe um, back, middle, or lower abdomen pain are signs of impeding rupture. Um, if the aneurysm ruptures, the back pain will be constant. Oh, so intermittent right now. Okay, so we picked the right one, yeah. Um, and then let's see. So the other option that I was kind of torn with was the epigastric pain. 
So that was number four, and it says four is incorrect because the pain is in the lower abdomen or uh. back. Epigastric pain is more consistent with the cardiac or gastric problems. And then it says visualize the location of the abdominal aorta. All right, so they tried to trip me up, but they didn't get me, did they? All right, so next question, number 16. I'll just try to do a couple more because um, there are 17 questions. All right. So a clinic, um, a clinic nurse is prepared to administer several scheduled immunizations to a six-month-old infant. What are the appropriate actions of the nurse to take when preparing to administer the immunizations? All right. So what do we know about infants? Um, we know that they get... Um, immunizations in a different location than adults, right? Adults, we can do gluteal or we can do, because um, immunizations are iron, or we can do the deltoid. Um, and then the infants, they get it in their thigh. I think that's the valgus lateralis or something like that, right? And um, we know that they are going to have a shorter needle. Um, for adults, it is one in five eighths, I think, the needle size. Um, so infants are probably going to be smaller um, or shorter, I shouldn't say smaller. And then in adults, we uh. use a 25 gauge. So um, it would uh. also be smaller for them. Is it 25? I think 25. Yeah, 25. All right. So options, draw the vaccine into one syringe for injection. Um, if that's possible, yeah, you definitely want to do that. Two, administer injections into either the vas lateralis, into either vastus lateralis muscle. Yeah, so the thigh muscle will do that. Administer injection in either the dorsigudal muscle. No, you can't do that. Um, ask the patient to wait outside the exam room or the parent. No, you wouldn't do that. And, um, and then select a one inch needle. Yes, I probably would do that. And then wash hands. Yes. Okay, so what's your final answer? Three, which is the vastus, vastus lateralis muscle. Three, five, and six. Let's see, three, five, and six. Let's just see if I miss anything. Question mm -hmm. yeah, number 16. Let's see. Um, why did I say three, five, and six? Did I mean two, five, and six? What do I think? Um, hold on. Oh, yeah, two. Sorry. The vastus, lat the vastus lateralis was number two. So two, five, and six. So it looks like we got it right. This little crazy body. You just all over the place. You just all over the place. All right. So one is correct because you should not combine medications together in a syringe. Okay. I guess for infants, you wouldn't do that. Oh, well, no, in, in general, because you don't know if they'll have side effects. So I guess it just depends on what it is also. Um, and then, let's see. So two is correct because the appropriate injection site is in the thigh. We know that. It is incorrect because the, so three is incorrect because the dorsal gluteal muscle is the butt, and we would not do that in infants because we are always, um, <coughs> worried about hitting the sciatic nerve. And even when we do it in adults, we use that um, method. I forget the name of it, but basically you do it at like the iliac crest and you measure to make sure that you do not hit the sciatic nerve. All right, that would be bad, that would be very bad. All right, and then let's see. And then we also use a longer needle for IM muscles, one and a half inches. Um, uh, for adults, and then one inches for infants. Okay, and then six is correct because, of course, we always wash our hands prior and after any procedure. All right. So number sixteen. We are now on number 17. All right. So a nursing student. Oh, 
All right, I'm just going to go until um, one hour. So we have like six more minutes because I don't want him to be awake for too long either. All right, so question number 17. A nursing student is assigned to care for a client who is two days post um, total left hip replacement. Mm. Which observation mm. should be reported immediately to the staff mm. nurse? Mm. Immediately. Mm. Okay, so pain related, um, sorry, pain rated at a 5 over 10. They're probably going to have that anyways. A temperature mm. at 99.6 with a reddened incision. <coughs> reddened incision. incision. Um. And it's like a sign of infection. Pain and cramping in the right lower leg. Pain and cramping in the right lower leg. Um, but it doesn't say anything about, anything about red, tender, um, positive homing signs or anything like that. So I'm not sure. And then number four says difficulty tolerating weight-bearing activities on the left side. Well, that would be expected if they had left hip surgery anyway, so I can cancel at number four. I can cancel at number one. And then I'm going to pick between two and four. So temperature, infection, or pain, cramping in the right lower leg. So if they say lower, I feel like they're kind of hinting towards DVT. Um, and that is most dangerous. So maybe I would pick that because 99.6, that's just like a low grade fever and it's reddened. Um, that is not what's most important. What will the patient die from first? Probably the DVT if it goes undiagnosed. So let's just go with that. All right. So number 17, let's see. Um, so fever, that's what they wanted you to pick. So two is correct because infection of the right hip is a serious complication will cry removal of the implant total joint infection um is disastrous as they say with pre with um prevention of infection a priority usually the prophylactic antibiotic um will be ordered therefore the appearance of the wound would be a grave concern Okay, and then yes, it says three is incorrect um, because DVT is not expected until five or seven days post-op. Okay, so we're too soon, but yes, that was, um, we were kind of there. All right, so we just have to fine tune our ability to read the question, well, my ability to read the question. All right, so... Do, does it occur in 45 to 70% of clients after surgery? So, and then further assessment would be needed if they had positive Holman sign, um, which is the calf swelling. All right. Let's see, we've got two more minutes. So we have time for one more question. All right, so we're gonna go to question 18 and then that will be it. Um, so the client who is gravitated um, to pair one ruptures her membranes um, spontaneously with a large amount of clear fluid. A nurse performs a vaginal examination to discovers that the loop of the umbilical cord in the vagina, uh oh, that is not good. Which immediate action should be taken by the nurse? Are you going to place the, place the client on their left side, attempt to replace the cord, um, evaluate the client's hip, elevate the client's hips, and then cover the cord with dry, sterile gauze? I know that is not correct because if anything, you should cover it with a moist, um, sterile gauze. And then I probably would elevate the client's hips. I don't think I would try to attempt to replace the cord because that might cause damage out of my scope of practice as a nurse. Um, and then place the client on the left side. Um, I would just elevate the hips to make sure, like they'd be lying flat to make sure that nothing else comes out. Okay, why are you moving so much, huh? Why are you moving so much? All right, so that was question 18. Let's see. 
So question number 18, three is correct. Yes, so you want to elevate the client's hips immediately. Um, this is the priority intervention, and this helps release the pressure on the umbilical cord and an emergency cesarean section will have to be performed. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we are worried about um, umbilical cord compression and fetal bradycardia may result in this. So we have to make sure we get pressure off of that umbilical cord. Okay. And then it is contraindicated to try to replace the cord. And then also placing the client or the mom on her left side does not read the, relieve the pressure on the umbilical cord. All right, so I hope this is helpful. Um, for whatever reason, I was unable to, it just says unable to connect um, to chat. So um, that sucks, but maybe next time it will work. And then hopefully I can start doing some of these during the day um, when people are actually awake because it is coming 2.50 in the morning. He's awake. And I think one other person is awake, but they didn't comment. <laughs> but um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. We ended on question number, what was it, 18? I forgot that fast. We ended on question number 18. Look, he's gone. Yeah, okay, so we're going to start on number 19. There are 75 questions. Um, so hopefully we can start to move a little faster. Um, but I think it is helpful if I just share little bits and pieces of knowledge and how I reduce um, down to like one or two answers. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please go back and watch the, um, the test taking tips and I hope you guys have a great day and keep on studying, work hard, um, do a little bit every day. And don't just focus on the stuff that you are comfortable with, but focus on the things that you aren't um, exactly proficient with. Um, for me, that is definitely OB, because <laughs> I don't remember that stuff. I don't work at OB, never have, and probably never will, um, just because I prefer birthing at home. But that's a whole nother video to talk about. All right, so you guys enjoy yourselves, and I'm going to get this little guy back to sleep. Take care.